Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Greg Garfin uh, from the University of Arizona. I'm the uh, University Director of the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center, and it's my uh, pleasure to welcome everyone to uh, the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center's uh, webinar series for the uh, focusing on the fourth national climate assessment and findings that are uh, relevant to the Southwest and to the mission of the uh, Southwest TASC, or Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, so just very briefly, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the Southwest TASC, we are a partnership between the USGS and a consortium of universities uh, and research institutes pictured on the map here. Um, we foster collaboration between scientists and resource managers with the goals of collaboratively producing science, information, online tools and techniques that um, help land, water, cultural, wildlife and other resource managers to anticipate climate and environmental changes in the southwestern United States. So our focus today is on uh, findings from the fourth national climate assessment. The uh, national climate assessment uh, is mandated by Congress from the Global Change Research Act of 1990. Uh, as it says here on the slide, to assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human induced and natural processes of global change. And the U.S. Global Change Research Program is represented by these uh, 13 federal agencies. Um, the fourth National Climate Assessment came out in two volumes in 2017, the Climate Science Special Report, which analyzed trends in global change, again, both human-induced and natural changes, and projects changes for the uh, next 25 to 100 years. And then a second volume that came out um, approximately a year ago, focused on impacts, risks, and adaptation uh, to uh, um, analyze the effects of global change on the national, natural environment, agriculture, energy, land and water resources, transportation, human health and welfare, human social systems, and biodiversity. Uh, as you can see in uh, this image, it's the table of contents for that second volume, the impacts, risks, and adaptation. And we're focusing uh, today on the two chapters uh, highlighted in blue, tribes and indigenous people, and the Southwest chapter. So again, you can see that the assessment focuses on um, economic and resource management sectors, as well as regions and emerging issues. Today, our speakers include Rachel Novak, who is the coordinator of the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, Tribal Resilience Program, and she was uh, the federal coordinating lead author for the Tribes and Indigenous Peoples a chapter in the National Climate Assessment. Beth Rose Middleton Manning is a professor uh, at University of California, Davis, and chair of Native American Studies there, and she was also a National Climate Assessment author on the Southwest chapter. And uh, Shasta Ghan, uh, who is the environmental director for the Pala Band of Mission Indians in Pala, California, and she also has many other illustrious titles, and you will get to hear from these three, starting with uh, Beth Rose. So we will switch um, to Beth Rose now. <laughs> 
Thank you. Should I share my slides or are you sharing them on your end? Uh, you should share them from your screen. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. I'm honored to be able to speak on this webinar and be here with you all to reflect on the National Climate Assessment, particularly Chapter Five, uh, uh, Chapter 25 in the Southwest. And thank you, Greg, for that introduction. Greg also already provided much of this, but I wanted to state this in the way that I think about the goals of the National Climate Assessment. I believe we're acknowledging the extreme challenges that climate change presents to economy and infrastructure, as well as to the natural environment and ecosystem services, and then very specifically to human health and overall quality of life. And then we're assessing these risks um, particularly with a focus on the Southwest and looking at the vulnerability of specific populations. And I would say not only vulnerability, but also assets and strengths. And then I see our goal as empowering the contributors, the partners, the collaborators, and the readers to understand the risks and then create plans for responding to them um, and, and implementing those plans. So uh, just to recap too, this is our region that we're working on. These are the different regions represented in the National Climate Assessment in those specific chapters that Greg showed in the table of contents. We're working in the Southwest region, so including California, Nevada, and uh, the four states, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. I just made this map very quickly, uh, but showing the great diversity of Native nations, uh, and this is federally recognized specifically in this region, 182 tribes in the region, um, and then many more also petitioning for federal, federal recognition. And importantly, too, uh, many Native nonprofit organizations, including Native land trusts, that are focused on land stewardship and conservation and on responding to impacts of climate change. I work particularly in California, so uh, thinking a lot about the great diversity of Native nations in California, over a, well, 109 federally recognized tribes, uh, many more petitioning for federal recognition, and uh, just showing this map here to know that we work in our context in terms of, of working uh, within Native homelands and with these nations in our, within what is now known as California. And this map is of uh, federally recognized tribes in California. And you can see many small land bases due to the history of lack of ratification of treaties with California Native Nations. Uh, but these land bases don't reflect the um, areas that tribes are engaged in stewarding and protecting uh, and caring for and responding to the impacts of, of climate change on. So I thought I'd talk just briefly about a couple of the key messages and then how I see them uh, relating specifically to tribes and native nations in the region, and then reflect a little bit on NCA3 and NCA4 since I had a small role in working on both of them. So the first key message that we highlight in chapter 25, the Southwestern chapter of the National Climate Assessment is about water resources. So water has declined during droughts, due in part to human-caused climate change, intensifying droughts and floods, combined with critical water demands from increasing population, deteriorating infrastructure, and groundwater depletion suggest the need for flexible water management techniques that address changing risks over time. So in working with tribes, with Native nations, uh, one of the things that I think we really emphasize is the impact of historical uh, neo-colonial decision-making and how that impacts resources that are then further stressed by climate change. And I'm showing this map here of the Klamath River in Northwestern California and Southern Oregon. And I'll uh, just cite one of um, the partners I was able to work with, Joe Hostler at the Yurok tribe. A couple years ago, I was working with um, 
Department of Water Resources in California, and we reached out to Joe around a video we were working on called Climate Conversations about tribal members' observations of climate change in California, uh, particularly as related to water, but also more broadly. And I'll never forget one of the things that he said was how can we, you know, talk about how the, the river is stressed by climate change, speaking of the Klamath River, when we're dealing with an already stressed river system due to the series of dams on the Upper Klamath and the Reclamation, Bureau of Reclamation project for agriculture um, on the Upper Klamath in Southern Oregon. So what do you do with, a, with an already stressed system impacted by all these things? and uh, climate change. And these are some of the different manipulations of the Klamath River, including the BOR project that I mentioned, the Klamath River Hydroelectric Project, and then uh, very impactfully recently, in 2002, the release of water upstream for irrigation, despite a ruling that it was needed to protect fish in the river in the lower Klamath, uh, where Yurok fisheries are, uh, and other fisheries are impacted as well. And this is really well documented in the film River of Renewal by Jack Kohler. But this uh, horrible fish kill that occurred in 2002 saw well over 30,000 fish, probably closer to 50 or 60,000 fish dying on the Klamath. This was a, a horrible thing to see and it was ca caused by, by a pathogen, a disease in the fish, but it was exacerbated by lower water levels and warming water temperatures, which are directly impacted by the release of water upstream when it was needed downstream. So here you see a lot of impacts on the system. One of the ways this is being addressed in order to get to being able to deal with the further impacts of climate change is through the dam renew removal process. So the Klamath River Renewal Corporation will be working to remove four dams, is working to remove four dams beginning in 2021. This is a nonprofit formed by the signatories of the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement, and they will uh, have owned the dams and then be able to decommission them. So I, I just wanna wrap that up there by saying that we have to deal with these, you know, historic management decisions that were made without uh, the tribe's permission on key resources. And it's hard to even call the Klamath River a resource as it's, it's a living being recognized recently for its personhood by the Yurok tribe in their codes. Uh, but historic poor decision making that has exacerbated impacts on a system that is now impacted by climate change. So we have to deal with undoing those impacts uh, before we can even address climate change. Second key message I wanted to talk about, uh, ecosystems and ecosystem services. So the integrity of Southwest forests and other ecosystems, their ability to provide habitat, water, economic livelihood, it's declining as a result of drought and wildfire, uh, due in part to human causes. Greenhouse gas emissions also play a role in mismanagement of fire. So one of the ways uh, we think about this Southwest chapter and with the Climate Adaptation Science Center, as Greg mentioned, is through supporting the reintroduction of fire on the landscape, um, particularly traditional uh, indigenous burning led by tribes and native nonprofits. So we know that fire suppression has reduced resiliency to fire and to drought, that it impacts the abundance and health of traditional foods, which we do talk quite a bit about in chapter 25, in terms of impacts on acorns in particular and other culturally important species, such as plants used for weaving. And how do we reverse this? Hopefully through tribally led restoration projects that incorporate traditional burning. I have a couple of images here. One is of Ron Good from North Fork Mono. He's the chairman there and his nephew uh, attending a cultural burn in the Sierra foothills. I've been able to take uh, classes out to work with him, which has been a really empowering and enriching experience. And on the left uh, is a image from a Mountain Maidu fire crew, which did a collaborative project with several, several partners, including community members and families, students at Feather River College, the Feather River Land Trust, and they were working on um, under burning and pile burning in an oak grove in the traditional homeland of Mountain Maidu people. This is an image from a, a um, session my class had with Ron Good burning basketry plants um, down by Mariposa in his, within his traditional homeland. Uh, this is taken right from chapter 20, 
25, uh, focusing on cultural fire, re reintroduction of cultural fire, or maintaining introduction of cultural fire at Yurok in Northwestern California. Uh, the tribe is using low to medium intensity fires to enhance the production of medicines, traditional basket materials uh, and foods, and to reduce the risk of catastrophic fire. The next key message I'd like to mention again is returning to traditional foods, natural resource based livelihoods, cultural resources, and spiritual well being. So the impact. Uh, the impact is keenly felt, deeply felt, more felt on indigenous people, um, the impacts of climate change, drought, wildfire, changing ocean conditions. And so tribes are really taking a leadership role in implementing adaptation measures, emissions reductions. Um, these are a couple of examples. I recently went to a conference hosted by the Washoe Tribe of Nevada and California. Uh, as other tribes are doing, they hosted a tribal resilience and climate change symposium, and they and others were deeply engaged in developing their own climate change plans. Uh, this is an example of the Yurok tribe's climate change adaptation plan, and there are many of these. Some of them can be found on the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals website. And then highlighting uh, Blue Lake, which we mentioned in both Chapter 25 in uh, the recent NCA4, as well as in NCA3, Chapter 17, about all of their incredible energy efficiency, uh, carbon neutrality, energy independence uh, initiatives there in Northwestern California. So just some examples of tribal leadership in adaptation planning and implementation. And briefly, a little reflection on these same chapters in both NCA3 and NCA4. So in NCA3, we worked on chapter 17, unique challenges facing Southwestern tribes. At that time, I was, I was looking back at the chapter and there was concern with the lack of data on climate change impacts in indigenous communities. We offered a lot more background on tribal sovereignty and tribal federal relationships. We had a similar emphasis on the extreme impacts of drought and wildfire um, and the link to the historic legacy of mismanagement of land by other entities and how that contributes to and exacerbates climate change impacts. And then we highlighted tribal initiatives, particularly energy conservation uh, and by a number of tribes, especially um, in terms of, of infrastructure, adding solar, adding you know, waste reduction, water use reduction mechanisms. And then in this most recent chapter, chapter 25 is not indigenous specific, although there is an indigenous specific chapter in NCA4, which uh, Rachel will be talking about, um, I believe. But we, we focused, uh, Julie Maldonado and I in particular focused on the indigenous specific aspects of chapter 25. There's more attention to health impacts in general, uh, perhaps, you know, as a result of what we're seeing, the impacts of increasing heat, increasing drought, uh, increasing wildfire, and how that's felt in native communities and nations. And I know Shasta might talk about that also. Uh, there's also more attention to food impacts on traditional foods, maybe due to increasing declines and uh, data and monitoring on those declines in those foods. There's more research on the impacts available. So people have been developing projects and sharing results, um, particularly collaborative projects. And then we mentioned new strategies such as tribal participation in the carbon offset programs. So just a couple of, of differences between uh, these two NCAs. And just thank you so much. It was on part of the team and to participate in this webinar today. Thank you. Thank you, Beth Rose. Um, that was great. Uh, we'll transition over to Rachel. And as we do that, I just wanted to mention that uh, you can submit questions via the Q&A window. Uh, you'll have to mouse over the bottom of your screen to bring up that menu, and we will answer questions at the after all three of the presentations. So uh, take it away, Rachel. Okay. Um, are my slides visible to everyone? Yes, we can see them. Good Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, as Greg mentioned, um, my name is Rachel Novak. I'm the BIA's Tribal Resilience Program uh, Coordinator. Um, and the climate science coordinator. <laughs> um, uh, I did serve as the federal coordinating lead author for the chapter 15 uh, 
tribes and indigenous peoples of the fourth national climate assessment. I had a, a great author team. We worked about three years to develop this chapter. Um, and the NCA4 um, is really progressing in terms of addressing impacts um, and actions um, of indigenous, impacts on and, and actions of indigenous peoples. In chapter 15, um, as has already been evidenced uh, by Beth's uh, talk, isn't the only place uh, where the assessment addresses indigenous peoples issues. Um, um, so, um, we did coordinate with the authors across um, the entire assessment to ensure that there was integration and representation of indigenous peoples issues and actions in every chapter and author team. Um, and many authors and contributors um, to those sections are on, uh, on this call, um, Greg, Shasta, and Beth. Um, and uh, I just have to say, we, we did present posters at the American Geophysical Union in, in Washington, D.C. last December. And I just wanted to mention, it was really, um, it was really inspiring to me, um, kind of visually, to see um, all of these posters and seeing key message after key message um, from all of the regional chapters and many of the sectoral ones that were addressing impacts and actions um, of indigenous peoples. So, <clears throat> we'll go through the next slide. Okay, so um, our state of the sector. Um, our chapter um, uh, kind of sets the stage by reorganizing, uh, recognizing several um, key points um, prior to getting into the three key messages that we have. Uh, the first is the indigenous peoples in the United States are diverse and distinct political and cultural groups and populations. The second is though indigenous, indigenous peoples may be affected by climate change in ways that are similar to others in the United States. Indigenous peoples can also be affected uniquely and disproportionately. And the third is many indigenous peoples have lived in particular areas for hundreds, if not thousands of years or time immemorial, as we often say. And indigenous people's histories and shared experience engender distinct knowledge about climate change impacts and strategies for adaptation. Um, and then lastly, um, to set the stage, um, is indigenous people's traditional knowledge systems uh, can play a role in advancing uh, the understanding of climate change and in developing more comprehensive climate change uh, adaptation strategies. So uh, it's not all about the impacts and vulnerabilities, of course. Um, so our task as an author team was to build on and not replicate what was previously done in, uh, in uh, those assessments that came before. Um, so we reviewed the most recent literature uh, for, for this, this MCA4, and especially tried to also focus on adaptation actions that indigenous people, peoples have been undertaking. So the impacts and actions are woven throughout our three key messages, um, and they're focused on livelihoods and economies, indigenous values-based health, and adaptation. Um, so our first key message is focused on indigenous livelihoods and economies at risk. Um, the third NCA, uh, back in 24, released back in 2014, really set a strong baseline um, uh, that really um, uh, delved really well into the climate change impacts on traditional livelihoods and economies. And we wanted to build on that and also address some of the impacts on commercial tribal economies um, like energy, recreation, tourism. Um, these economies are affected by climate change, uh, but compounding and complicating this is often institutional barriers to self-determined management of water, land, um, and other natural resources, the relatives, um, and infrastructure. Um, so um, uh, this figure is from that key message, um, and it's a schematic of really how infrastructure and the essential services it develop, um, delivers are key to communities' livelihoods and economic potential. Uh, many indigenous peoples are already facing acute infrastructure challenges that compound climate change impacts. Um, so the text describes how the infrastructure of the household, community, and regional um, system levels are key to essential services, um, like disaster response, policing, health services, and that there are existing challenges um, in these uh, indigenous people's um, communities that can be compact, compounded by climate change impacts. Okay, um, and so our second key message is focused on more on the risk to physical, mental, and indigenous values-based health. Indigenous values-based based health is focused on the interconnectedness um, of social and ecological systems. So as climate change disrupts these systems, individual and community health 
will be uniquely challenged through those impacts to lands, waters, uh, foods, plants, and animals. These impacts can then threaten sites, practices, and relationships with cultural, spiritual, or ceremonial importance, um, or ceremonial importance um, to um, indigenous people's heritage, identity, and physical and mental health. Um, and our third key message is focused on adaptation, disaster management, displacement, and community love relocation. So as I mentioned earlier, um, though there's a lot of discussion and acknowledgement of risk, we also um, wanted to move forward from there too, uh, because there's so much ongoing in Indigenous communities. Um, many Indigenous communities have been proactively identifying and addressing impacts and developing um, adaptation plans, as Beth mentioned. Um, however, there are still institutional barriers that really severely limit adaptive capacity, including limited access to traditional territory and resources, um, limitations of existing policies, programs, and funding mechanisms. Um, the key message also discusses, um, importantly, how successful adaptation in Indigenous context relies on the use of Indigenous knowledge, resilient and robust social systems and protocols, and a commitment to principles of self-determined um, and proactive efforts of government at all levels to alleviate institutional barriers. Okay. Um, and so figure 15.3 um, really focuses on displacement um, and community-led relocation as part of the focus of our key message three. So the figure here illustrates um, some of the common issues uh, that are facing coastal areas and here in very two, two very different uh, locations. So on the left in the southeast, we have the Ile de Jean Charles in Louisiana. Um, and then on the right, um, an aerial, a photo of Kivalina um, up in Alaska. The so very different locations, um, but similar uh, political, ecological, and existential questions about adaptation. Okay. Um, in Figure 15.4 here, uh, the photo shows the community planning meeting um, of the tribal community of Ildijan Charles in Louisiana, um, and they have and who are confronting sea level rise and coastal inundation, as the previous photo um, shows. So we emphasize in, in this section get, that given the context of forced relocations of indigenous peoples over the last few centuries, um, that it is so important um, to have uh, relocation frameworks that project self-determination in our community-led. Okay. Um, so we, we were a sectoral chapter, uh, meaning we were very national in scope versus the, the chapters that were have more regional uh, focus areas. So, um, so all of those sectoral chapters were shorter. So we just had three key messages um, and those are, were the focus areas of, those, of them. Um, so I will um, continue on, but those uh, reflected our key messages. Um, so the authors that contributed to the indigenous people's um, content across the NCA4 uh, were trying to work together behind the scenes um, to really identify uh, terms that were used consistently across the NCA4 um, to try to make sure that we had a consistent usage um, of those terms and uh, that we created. And so we created um, together um, a a list basically and a small glossary um, of, of terms uh, and uh, definitions based on, on that. Um, based on, on um, our discussions together of what, how, what we meant and in, in how we use them across the, the NCA4. Um, so it's not definitive or exhaustive by any means, uh, but they were generally used, these terms were generally used more it seemed to be worthwhile in terms of providing the definitions and how they were used across the assessment. Um, so, and um, they are concise, and so it's a quick read if you want to take a look. Uh, but they are currently housed um, on the ITEP website. That's the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals. Um, so they're posted there, and you can um, go to this link here in, in the kind of the lower left um, if you would like to access them. Okay, um, and so for the last few minutes, I just wanted to circle back um, to focusing on um, 
adaptation actions. As an author team, we thought it was important to build on the previous assessment, as I, as I previously said, uh, by continuing to emphasize the impacts um, on and barriers facing indigenous peoples. Um, um, sorry, not only that, but also the adaptation actions, the, the many, many, many activities that tribes have undertaken over the last decade to address climate change through planning, vulnerability assessments, monitoring, capacity building, and more. So in 2016, we started um, to develop this database of actions by inquiring from our partner federal agencies that have funded tribal climate change adaptation, vulnerability especially, um, as well as um, our program. So we identified um, over a thousand actions um, and have developed this uh, living interactive web map. Um, uh, and our, I, I want to give a quick shout out to our uh, tribal resilience uh, geospatial analyst, David O'Donnell, um, and um, his predecessor, Margaret Herzog, um, who developed it. So please note that, that we see this as a living kind of document. So um, it's it's not exhaustive. So if you don't see something that's currently there that you're aware of um, or an upcoming activity um, that you think uh, would would um, represent well, please uh, send an email to resilience.news.bia.gov and we'll make sure and add it. Uh, the current link we have on our website for adding is um, not working right now. So just a quick drive through it. Um, yeah, you know, the legend shows um, a list of the different types of actions. Um, please note we added these attributes um, kind of post priori, um, and many are multi-sectoral since climate change impacts and adaptation actions are often multi-sectoral. Uh, but we did our best to try to tag each action um, under a type um, and under a sector as well. So you, um, you can uh, I'll search up here by the tribe or group name. Um, as well. Uh, so there's a few different ways to search and we'll go through those. Um, you can also just zoom in. Um, so we'll zoom in here from the, for the Southwest to take a closer look. Um, you can uh, filter by action type over here if you just want to focus on which type of action. And uh, we split those into uh, five different areas, planning and assessment, adaptation and implementation, and monitoring slash research, governance slash capacity building, and use cultural continuity and again we did these obviously these these um you know didn't necessarily have tags before that so we did our best to try to put them in um a bin that would be helpful okay so when you click on one of these action icons um especially if you're zoomed out it'll um it'll come up basically with with several. So this, um, when I click here, it, refers, uh, it, it pulls up basically seven. So this is just one of seven. Um, so the first one is from the Big Valley Pomo, uh, Big Valley Band of Pomo Indians, um, and Big Valley Rancheria um, and the project that they did together. Um, and so if you click right here on the arrow, um, it will pull up a second record. And this one is from the Habimatolel Pomo of Upper Lake. Um, and if you keep clicking, go to the third one. This one's for the Robinson Rancheria Band of Pomo Indians. And so in case it's hard to see in your screens, as it may be, um, here's just a, a kind of a little blow up uh, screenshot. Um, so basically, um, these pop-ups show a tribal nation, a tribal organization, um, an activity type, um, the sectoral tag, and then a link for more information. Um, so going a little bit further um, south to the Tona Otham Nation, um, we here again, uh, this one represents one of four activities. Um, but if, if you um, click on this ellipse down here, it will open up an attribute table. Um, and you can see in more tabular form uh, those actions. So there's a few different ways to, to look through this. Um, and then also, if um, if you're just looking at a particular um, location of interest, you kind of zoom to a particular region you're interested in, and you click on this um, arrow down at the bottom, it'll pull up an attribute table for that whole region. Um, and assuming you have all the actions um, um, clicked, it will bring everything up um, from that. Um, so here, there's 208 actions just in this region represented. Um, and you can uh, filter further down by clicking on options and um, going into a little bit more depth depending on if there's like a sector or um, a 
an activity type that is of more interest to you. So, um, I did, yeah, thank you for <laughs> indulging me and taking you through a quick ride through um, our interactive mapping map, uh, app, interactive mapping application. <laughs> um, yeah, again, it's a living document. Um, we really hope that it can be something of use um, to to others and um, especially as uh, future national climate assessment products are, are developed, that that can be something that um, could be uh, uh, used in, in the future and an added to. So, um, so please, uh, if you know of any additional um, actions, feel free to email them to us again at resilience.news at bi.gov and we'll add them. Um, so yeah, I, I hope um, that was helpful. Um, that it really shows how much is going on um, across Indian country, Alaska Native villages. Um, and we added also as much as we knew and could find about Pacific and Caribbean indigenous uh, communities as well, um, since those are we're all, all included within indigenous peoples um, in the national climate assessment. Um, so I want to make sure, um, lastly, that I acknowledge all the authors uh, that were on my team and the coordinators uh, that worked so hard for the last three years on this. Um, Makiaha, thank you so much um, for joining us today. and. Um, appreciate your time. I will end right here. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. That was the overview of the Tribes and Indigenous Peoples chapter in the National Climate Assessment. And um, that's, a, that's a really fabulous tool that uh, you're developing with the, uh, with the Bureau. Um, our final speaker is uh, Dr. Shasta Gan, and uh, our intent here was to contrast uh, some of the messages from the National Climate Assessment with experiences from practitioners uh, who uh, work for or with tribes. And um, Shasta will present that uh, point of view. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Greg. And thank you, Beth Rose and Rachel for sharing the work that you did on this assessment. And I applaud you for the tremendous amount of work and coordination and cooperation that that sort of project takes, uh, not to mention the amount of time. I was a contributing author on the fourth California climate assessment on the tribal chapter there, and Beth Rose was a part of that as well. And I can tell you from that experience that I am not the best at herding cats, and there's a whole lot of them when you're dealing with this sort of project. So, you know, that said about the amount of work that it takes, I want to acknowledge also that even though I'm about to talk about some of the challenges and the gaps and the needs that I have found as a practitioner, that I still want to acknowledge the importance of the work that's being done and how it's really impossible with something that's nationwide or even statewide to be able to drill down into the specific needs of any one individual community. Nonetheless, as practitioners, and I know that there are several of you on the call because I looked at the list and I see a couple of names and, and familiar faces and colleagues, we, I think, share some of the same concerns about what is happening with our own work and what some of our challenges are. So, oop, there we go. So, let's start with challenge number one, the number of tribes. In California alone, as Beth Rose said, for federally recognized tribes, there's 109, I believe, and then 182 tribes in the Southwest area. And I found it really illuminating to look at both Beth Rose's map that showed all those little dots for all of the different tribal communities within that area, and then to look at Rachel's map of all of the actions that have taken place. And even though there are a whole lot of actions, there are still more tribes then there are actions on that map, which means that a lot of us are still facing that challenge of what are we going to do for the specific communities that we are responsible for. And as far as that being a challenge for the assessment, you know, of course you're not gonna be able to address every single tribe, but just the sheer number of tribes alone is going to create a, a tremendous challenge in terms of being able to prevent or provide, I should say, information that's useful for specific communities, as well as as an overall assessment of what's going on with uh, the climate space. 
going along with that is the challenge of the diverse cultures and traditions. If there are 562, and actually there's more than that now, federally recognized tribes and then multiple other non-federal tribal groups, those are just as many diverse cultures and traditions. So if you're doing an assessment of what is of value and what is at risk because of climate change, what's at risk for Paula and what's important for the community that I work for, may be very different than what's important even for another community that's nearby, like the 29 Palms Band, like the Morongo Band, like Rincon. And then moving into Northern California, as I'm sure many of you know, the whole state's on fire again. And my friends at Middletown Rancheria, Grayton Rancheria, they're in the evacuation zone. They're gonna have different issues in terms of what's important in their culture and traditions what sorts of species are important to them that need to be saved? What kinds of ecosystems are going to be at the top of the list as far as being able to maintain cultures and traditions? So that's an enormous challenge as well. Here's a big one. And I know you guys can only hear me and I can't hear you, but I, I can feel psychically your groans of agreement about the lack of funding. That's an enormous challenge. And I'll be honest here about my, my lack of knowledge. I don't know who pays for the climate assessment, but I can tell you that wherever that money is coming from, there's not enough of it. And there's certainly not enough of it for all of us who are trying to run our own programs and develop our own assessments and our own adaptation plans. And then on top of that, the ability to implement those plans. So that's one of the biggest challenges we all face and that needs to be addressed in future assessments. If it's been addressed in the first three and even in number four, then I think it needs to be even more of a focus in future assessments. And then this is one that I have a lot of personal experience with, the lack of coordination with agencies and researchers. Researchers are great. They provide us with a lot of the information that we need and then the agencies in many cases are coordinating with the researchers or they have researchers of their own, but are they coordinating with tribes? So here in San Diego, the city of San Diego has a climate adaptation plan. The county of San Diego is working on a climate adaptation plan, but they haven't reached out to the 18 federal tribal uh, nations, federally recognized tribal nations in San Diego County to make sure that their plans and our plans are not working at cross purposes. There's this tendency to hear, well, those are tribal lands, so therefore we don't have the right to go onto those lands, and so they end up being blank spaces on the map. Now, I work with a lot of good people here in San Diego. I work with the Climate Science Alliance. I work with ITEP to be able to coordinate some of those efforts so that we are not having those gaps on the maps anymore. And I like to say that Climate change does not stop at tribal boundaries. It doesn't stop at any boundary. So that coordination challenge remains a, a significant challenge for many of us. Moving on to the gaps. And a lot of these are uh, very similar to the challenges. We have an information gap. One of the projects I just got funded through uh, BIA, thank you very much, Rachel, <laughs> is a project to develop health data for tribes. So that as we work on the health aspects of our climate adaptation plans and our vulnerability assessments, we have access to some of the national level data, the scientific data, to fill in those gaps of information about how our communities and our, our members are going to be affected by the health impacts of climate change. But we also need information in terms of the weather patterns, in terms of drought effects. So an information gap still exists that needs to be addressed. Coordination, similar to what I just said about coordination with agencies, it's not just coordination with agencies and other municipalities that surround tribal lands, uh, but coordination with one another, coordination with larger intertribal agencies, coordination so that rather than duplicating one another's efforts, we are coordinating to make sure that we have a consistent effort that is useful for everybody. Uh, it can be a little bit disconcerting or disheartening sometimes to see that you've put a whole lot of effort into something and then realize somebody else already did that, but because you didn't have that coordination, you didn't know. So you put effort into something that you didn't need to because that, that effort had already been made. Implementation is an enormous gap 
We have money for helping us do our assessments. We have some money for helping us with our adaptation plans. Where's the funding for the implementation of the things that we need to do as tribes to be able to protect our communities, protect our constituents, uh, and protect our uh, ecologies? Implementation is one of the biggest gaps that I have noticed, and it's very, very troubling to me because we can assess and we can create all the plans that we want to, but if we don't have the ability to implement those plans, then we're not going to be able to do very much work. Which leads to my favorite funding. Once again, I have to put it on there because all of these things are affected by the funding gap that we all experience. So I would like to see more discussion on where funding can come from in future assessments and how that funding is going to be leveraged in the most efficient and coordinated way possible. Needs. So you might notice by now challenges and gaps and needs are all pretty much along the same lines. We have needs to address the gaps and the challenges. So time. Time is a huge one. Again, we're doing this as a webinar, so I can't ask for a show of hands, but I, was, I would love to ask, if you wanna throw this into the chat box, have any of you had the time to read not just the entire national fourth assessment, but even the indigenous chapter or the Southwest chapter? I don't have a whole heck of a lot of time. Today is a grant report due date for every single one of my federal grants. So as soon as we're done here, I'm gonna keep working on my gap grant. I'm sure a lot of you are doing the same thing if you have one. Where do we find the time to do all of the things that we need to do to be able to protect and uh, leverage our resources for working on this climate change issue? Collaboration, similar to coordination. Collaboration is a need that I think we need to address in terms of collaboration with the climate scientists on the ground, uh, collaboration with other entities that are facing the same challenges and gaps, collaboration so that we can take what funding there is and spread it enough so that we can have consistency and we're not reinventing the wheel with each of our individual projects. If we can work together and collaborate, we can make that funding and the resources that we have go farther. And speaking of resources, those are things we need as well. I would love to have the resources to hire a full-time climate change strategist for my department. And even though I work for a tribe that has some significant financial resources, we have a successful casino, it's still not enough. And so for those tribes and those communities who don't have that, the resources to be able to not just have the money, which of course is always an important resource, but resources in terms of staff time, resources to be able to go out into the community and talk to people, that is a very significant need that we need to see addressed. Oh look, my favorite. I think I have three different ways of saying this. Funding, money, and then maybe funding again. <laughs> but it is a great deal of, uh, of money that we need to make these things happen. So I'm not gonna beat that horse any further. I've already said it. So finally, the assessment of the assessment, tribal knowledge. You know, and as Rachel and Beth Rose both mentioned, tribal knowledge is a key part of the, the indigenous chapter. It's a key part of the indigenous message portion of the Southwest chapter, but tribal knowledge is the same, or I, I should say tribal knowledge is not the same from place to place. So I would love to see an assessment that focuses just on tribes and tribal knowledge and have that not just be a chapter or a portion of a chapter, but be an entire assessment of its own. Now, considering I just talked about a lack of funding, I'm probably fantasizing here because that takes money and resources. But tribal knowledge is different from the knowledge that we get from other communities and areas that are impacted by climate change, and it's important. Tribal needs. What are tribal needs? Tribes are sovereign nations. Tribes have very specific individual needs, they have specific community needs, they have specific cultural and traditional needs. And in many cases, these needs are not the same as some of the broader needs that we're seeing discussed in the overall national assessment. Tribal needs are specific and they need to be addressed in a way that is more helpful and more carefully tailored to those specific needs. I already mentioned uh, briefly tribal sovereignty, but 
tribal sovereignty is both a positive in terms of the relationship, uh, the government to government relationship, although that can be problematic as well, but it also creates issues in terms of, as I mentioned, local municipalities, even state governments, county governments, not acknowledging that because tribes are sovereign, they think that they can't have relationships with the tribes, and, and that's not true. So some assessment of that relationship and some potential solutions for how that can be overcome would be a good thing to include in future assessments. And then I just want to say a brief word about tribal justice. And for me, tribal justice includes not just discussions of the aftermath of colonialism and the continued impacts of neocolonialism, but environmental justice, gender justice, cultural justice. If we don't acknowledge the past and the ways that justice has been taken away from tribal communities and still is not being redressed, then I don't think that we're going to be able to effectively address the impacts of climate change. Tribal justice needs to be at the core and at the basis of future assessments. Oops. And if you're interested in calling me or emailing me or otherwise yelling at me or agreeing with me or disagreeing with me, here's how you get in touch with me. And I want to stop with that because we just have a few minutes left for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shasta. That was great um, for giving your, your take on the, the NCA. Uh, we do have some questions, and um, but please feel free to type more questions as they come up for you. Uh, the first question I have is from Christopher Fullerton, and he's asking, what challenges and solutions have been part of the effort of accommodating diverse traditional knowledge systems in an NCA process that privileges Western peer-reviewed or published knowledge? So I think that's probably a question for Beth Rose or um, for Rachel. And you might be muted, so I'm going to unmute both of you. Okay. Can you hear me? This is Rachel. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a good question, and it's something we definitely came up against um, pretty early in the process. Um, and yes, uh, the assessment um, really focuses heavily on peer review literature. Um, and that was something that we um, were wondering about, you know, because indigenous knowledge, um, you know, often more orally transmitted and, um, you know, not really part of that, um, that body of, of peer reviewed knowledge peer-reviewed published uh, works. And um, so one of the, I guess, steps that we took that hopefully is a step forward, but definitely, you know, has a way to go, ways to go, um, is that we uh, worked with um, the coordinators of the assessment um, so that um, we, we could cite things that weren't part of that um, peer-reviewed literature um, um, knowledge base. Uh, but it, it did need to be corroborated by the peer review literature. Um, so that was that was kind of um, the compromise that, that we made there that we're able to make. Um, but certainly we, we have um, we have a ways to go and hopefully um, in future products or the next assessment we can we can make further strides there. Um, so we were able to incorporate some but um, but we still have a ways to go because it, it was still, you know, depending on being corroborated by um, the published uh, peer-reviewed literature. So, but yeah, good question and, and definitely still an ongoing issue. Thanks. Uh, this is Beth Rose. Uh, just to add a tiny bit to that, and I appreciate Rachel's point there. And what I've learned from working with Rising Voices, um, which is a, a collaborative of people from many different sectors working on, on climate issues with an emphasis on, on indigenous-focused climate issues and adaptation strategies uh, has been the, the effort to kind of create a canon, to create that peer-reviewed literature um, that includes indigenous-specific research, indigenous-specific perspectives. Uh, and I know, you know, I've learned quite a bit about that from my colleague, Julie Maldonado, and there was a special issue of climatic change that attempted to contribute to that. I know Kyle White was one of the contributors and there were many others. Uh, so that 
one, one part of the effort in response to the question has been to create the literature ourselves in collaboration with partners that can then be cited. There's also you know, new um, Forest Service reports, some of the work by Frank Lake, for example, Ron Good, Don Hankins, and others that also uh, documents traditional knowledge, traditional um, stewardship practices um, that we were able to cite as well as tribal climate adaptation plans. Uh, so those are not necessarily peer reviewed literature, but in terms of looking for written sources. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you, Rachel and Beth Rose. Um, one comment here, this was on uh, Shasta's uh, question that she posed to everyone about reading the NCA chapters. Um, one person said no. And another uh, participant said that they have read, this is Nikki Cooley, has read chapter 15 and the Southwest chapter, but has only skimmed over the other chapters. Um, they're rather long chapters, so that is understandable. It's, it's a little bit like having an encyclopedia. You yeah. consult it when you have the time and the need and the interest. Mm -hmm. Um, we did have one attendee that had the idea, a lot of students at universities have read a lot of the chapters, um, so there is a thought of trying to tap into that resource, um, if that's a possibility. Are there any other questions? And please type those into the Q&A window. Um, here's a question for Beth Rose. How many other tribes have gone back to traditional burning? That's a great question. I don't have a number. Um, there's, I just showed some examples of some of our, our partners, uh, but I haven't compiled a list. There's also some information about traditional burning in the California Climate Assessment chapter that Shasta mentioned that we worked on or the specific report on tribal and indigenous peoples. But I, I can't tell you how many tribes, uh, but I know it is an important initiative and movement to bring, to bring back burning for landscape health and also to mitigate uh, or reduce some of the impact of climate change. Great, thank you. Um, next question. How will the next assessment improve upon the NCA4? Will or can it be longer? This is a hard question, but she's curious of what uh, Rachel and others think. Um, that, it is a good question. This is Rachel. I, I don't know because, um, uh, you know, I haven't heard very much about that process yet in terms of NCA5. and what the plans are there. Um, we're still doing a lot of outreach for NCA4, so um, I don't know right now what's going on kind of at the like um, higher levels uh, with regards to discussion of, you know, how that process will go and differences from NCA4 and NCA3. Um, so yeah, unfortunately I can't speak too well too much to that. But I don't know if Greg or others or Beth or Shasta have heard anything else. Um, this is Greg. Thanks, thanks for your answer, Rachel. Um, I have um, not heard anything from the U.S. Global Change Research Program about the uh, fifth assessment, um, but I, um, given the scope of the assessment, uh, it's hard for me to um, imagine that uh, that it'll be longer, and if if the person who wrote the question when you when you mention can it be longer, um, if you if if the underlying concern is can it be more specific, I think because it's a national level assessment, we'll, we'll probably never get down um, through that initiative to. Um, you know, to finer and finer scales. Um, 
However, I think what is more likely is that there'll be more add-ons to the climate assessment as there were with this fourth assessment where there are links to some uh, interactive and off, um, off-site uh, resources. Yeah, and to add to that, Greg, um, at least um, as NCA4 kind of author teams, we're kind of instructed to look at um, the most recent literature that's come out, you know, really since the last assessment in the last four years um, and kind of update basically the last assessment rather than um, rather than kind of retreading what has already been tread. Um, and uh, so, you know, we, um, we actually were keeping a uh, parking lot of, of topics that came up um, during different parts of the review cycle, the public review cycle. Um, and there were really important topics that were mentioned, but that we just didn't have a lot of um, information or literature on. Um, things like um, harmful algal blooms, I th we thought there would be a lot of literature out there, um, and that was something mentioned in the comments, and, and we didn't actually find very much um, specific to tribes other than kind of some newspaper articles. Um, and energy in, in many different ways, uh, you know, renewable energy, energy impacts um, from climate change, um, and, uh, you know, energy has lots of different facets, but that was another area where we didn't find um, a lot um, focused more on, on um, tribal communities, indigenous communities. Um, so uh, we were keeping that and hoping to pass it off to whoever takes the reins for the next assessment. Um, so we would hope that, um, I would envision at least that um, a lot of those um, items that were mentioned um, during review cycles um, as being kind of missing from from this one would be able to be taken up and focused on in, in the in the next one. So that's one way I think I, I would see it as being um, a bit different um, in ways that would make sense to me. You know, they would they, they would do probably not controversial in in, um, in moving ahead on those topics. Um, so I feel pretty comfortable in saying that that might that would probably be a way that it would be different in the future. Just those different topics that hopefully there would be more up to date information on. Um, in the in the literature in the, the last four years or the next four years really <laughs> thanks rachel uh so one comment it, it looks like in the chat window if you're able to access that um someone put up a, some information about the indigenous people's burning network and there's a link to um the conservation gateway website um, which should be helpful to answer the question on traditional burning um, and then there's another question. Has anyone on the panel done any kind of research on the upper basin and lower basin contingency plans? Um, before I uh, pass that over to the panel, I just want to say we are going to be having two more of these webinars. One will be on ecosystems and the other will be on water resources in the southwest. And so that webinar will discuss um, the contingency plans, not so much um, related to tribes, so maybe someone on the panel could speak to that. Um, but we will send out information about those other two webinars at yeah. a later date. And the water webinar will be on November 20th. Has, has anyone else done any work? I, I presume when you say upper basin and lower basin, you mean the Colorado River Basin uh, contingency plans. Uh, Rachel, Beth Rose, Chasta, any? input to that process? Not from me, this is uh, Not from me either, this is Beth Rose. Yeah, and I would probably punt this over to the, um, one, one of our two liaisons, the Tribal Resilience Liaison. Um, I know Maurice Cruz, um, he is the Tribal Resilience Liaison uh, funded to work with um, the South Central Cast, but focused on uh, New Mexico tribes. I know he's familiar with some researchers that are doing more work um, I think in the upper basin um, at UNM and maybe the lower basin, or maybe I have this switched around, but, um, but he would probably be a good contact um, and maybe potentially I'll say Walker as well. Uh, but I know recently that he had mentioned some researchers he was working with um, on um, one of the upper or lower basin plans. Thanks. Yeah, and Althea Walker is a tribal climate science liaison at um, the Southwest 
task. So if you go to our website, um, which I will say in a little bit, her information is there. Um, and it looks like some of uh, some colleagues of the Nature Conservancy are involved in the Water and Tribes Initiative, which is deeply involved in drought contingency plan implementation. Um, okay, so we have one more question before we adjourn. Uh, last question, does the existence of a dedicated chapter on indigenous communities do more to raise their profile or instead create a new isolated silo? Based on your experiences, would you propose another new chapter such as a broad-based and integrated cultural heritage chapter? So this is Shasta and I'll, I'd like to take a stab at this. Uh, my, my background, my educational background, I am a cultural anthropologist and I am always looking at the human behavioral component and the cultural components of climate change action and adaptation or in some sad cases, climate denial. And so, oh, and I'm also uh, part of my job here at Paula, I'm not just the environmental director, I'm also the tribal historic preservation officer. So the cultural heritage part of that uh, is something that I'm concerned about and the impacts of climate change on cultural heritage. But I think that you can answer this in, in two ways. I think it is possible that having a separate chapter does increase the potential of tribal nations being seen as something separate. And I think that maintaining that sense of separation can be problematic at times uh, of, of creating a silo as if tribal concerns and broader concerns aren't mutual. And in many cases, there's, there's, they are mutual. There's a lot of crossover between those two uh, different things. Uh, so, but at the same time, I think that tribal needs are unique. And so I would, I would hesitate to not have an indigenous communities chapter in future assessments because the needs of the community that I work for, I know are very different from the needs of other surrounding non-tribal communities. So I'd rather take the risk of potentially having there be a, a siloed sort of consequence than to not have it be addressed at all. Uh, this is Beth Rose. I would I would agree with that. I think it's very important to have a tribal and indigenous communities chapter that's very specifically focused on on tribes and specific issues dealing with climate impacts and adaptation. But I also think it's important to have sections and integration of indigenous specific perspectives, issues, concerns, um, plans in all of the other chapters. So. You know, I was happy to be able to work on, on that aspect of the Southwest chapter and to see it in other chapters as well. So that then you, you don't have the siloing, but you do have a, a highlight in a specific chapter and then attention to indigenous perspectives in the other chapters also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is Rachel. Um, and we actually um, asked, you know, uh, a group, I think it was in National Adaptation Forum back in 2017, um, you know, when we were kind of uh, approached uh, to, to help lead the, the Chapter 15 Tribes and Indigenous Peoples. Um, and the response that we got back from um, the room was basically, you know, we, we still want an Indigenous Peoples chapter, um, and, but we do want to be represented in the regional chapters as well. And so this was, um, you know, we kind of struck that balance, I feel like, pretty well in the fact that I think just about every single regional chapter has a key message focused on indigenous um, issues in their regions. Um, so I felt like, you know, the integration has really moved ahead from where it was in NCA3, um, and we'll see how we can improve in NCA4 and um, whoever the author team is then. Um, but I think, um, I, yeah, I think that you would lose a lot if you, if you kind of um, included indigenous communities just in with a cultural heritage chapter. Um, there's so much uniqueness, you know, across across um, all of uh, you know indigenous nations across the United States already as it is. Um, to then further kind of um, mix that in with um, you know general cultural heritage chapter, I think would really uh, lose a, you know really result in a, a big loss. You know, you wouldn't be able to. Um, include the unique land tenure systems of tribes, um, treaty rights to tribes, um, you know, nation to nation and trust relationships with tribes um, that other communities don't have um, because of the, you know, 
because there is a, a, a unique political status. Um, and I speak more to federally recognized tribes because of where I sit, but um, you know, other indigenous uh, groups also share, you know, a lot um, and, you know, are considered themselves nations as well and um, with uh, unique um, connections and sovereignty to the land that they're from. And so I feel like that that would probably be lost and uh, we would probably get a lot of um, uh, people upset uh, with that loss and, and kind of feeling like those unique um, aspects would be kind of dissolved if they were kind of included just more in a general front lines community chapter. Um, so I felt like we got a really strong no, we want to keep having this chapter, but we also want to be integrated into the regional chapters and, and the sectoral chapters. And I think, I think we probably still have a little ways to go there, but, but I, think we're, I think we're on that trajectory. So thanks. Yeah, so um, we've gone over by about 12 minutes here, and I want to, um, for the, the folks that are still on, I'd like to thank all of you for attending. I'd like to really thank the speakers. And, you know, I think uh, with research presentations, there tends to be uh, polite applause, and I'd like to invoke the image of the gigantic sports gathering and tens of thousands of people applauding for the great efforts of our uh, three speakers. And I would like to just uh, mention too, that when you leave the webinar, a survey link will pop up. Please take the time to answer the survey. We are, we've been recording this presentation and it'll be posted on the Southwest CAST website, SWCASC dot arizona.edu. We'll post that in a few days. And uh, thanks again for um, really fabulous presentations, questions, and discussion. Thank you, Greg and Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, go on it.